On the show today is Dr. Donald Carveth, who is an emeritus professor of sociology and social and political thought at York University in Toronto, as well as a veteran psychoanalyst. On top of being a published author, Don also runs a YouTube channel, uh, which he regularly posts on psychoanalytic thought. Uh, he has a fantastic series on the history of psychoanalysis called Freud and Beyond, which I would recommend you checking out if you're into that sort of thing. The main topic of the show is Freud's infamous Oedipal complex. We also talk about Don's origin story, where he thinks Freud went wrong, uh, the emasculation of modern man, and what advice he'd give himself if he were to start over in life again. And without further ado, a conversation with Dr. Don Carvith. Why don't you start with uh, your your origin and what uh, led you to develop an interest in the psychoanalytic field? It came very early, about 14 or 15. My, my dad was a busy family doctor, a GP, general practitioner, and he was a very busy guy. And um, I, of course, wanted to connect with him. And I noticed that, you know, he was up reading uh, till two in the morning and he had a big stack of books on his bedside table. Most of them I couldn't make sense of, you know, Einstein, Alfred North Whitehead, whatever. I couldn't deal with that. But um, one day Freud's um, general introduction to psychoanalysis showed up and I started to read that. And boy, did I connect with that? Um, I made a great nuisance of myself that summer. Uh, every morning I was requiring people to tell me their dreams and I was giving them my rough and ready dream interpretations over the breakfast table. Um, I knew right then I wanted to be a psychoanalyst, uh, but my understanding was that that meant first medical school, like my dad. And ever since I was a kid, when my dad would take me on calls, the patients would say, are you going to be a doctor like your dad? And I would always say, of course. So my plan was medical school and then psychiatry and then psychoanalysis. That was my plan. But I should have learned early on uh, that that maybe wasn't such a good plan because on the weekends, my dad did not have a nurse and some kid would fall off a bike and gash open his head. And I would be 10 years of age upstairs playing and my dad would call me down to the surgery. And my only job was to clip the stitches as he was sewing up the kid's head. I just had to clip the stitches. And every time, I think three times in a row, I wound up on the floor, out cold. Uh, uh, the sight of blood um, just wasn't for me. But I didn't, I didn't come to the conclusion that that meant medical school was a bad idea. I kept with the medical plan until first year university. I enrolled in pre-med studies, and I had a complete meltdown because I realized there was no way that I was going to cut up cadavers learn how to do rectal examinations and do all of that chemistry and all of the rest of that nonsense. So I transferred out of pre-meds into what we call sock and fill, social and philosophical studies. And I thought, well, I can never be a psychoanalyst. I thought you had to be a physician. So I said, well, I'll do second best. I'll be a psychologist. So I enrolled in uh, honors uh, psychology program only to find out that it was all about rats if you got lucky, you might get a dog. Um, I transferred out of psychology, it just zero interest. If anything, it was about the brain. It was not about the mind. And I was interested in the mind. Psychology so proper, to, yeah? Sorry? Like the hard, hard psychology. Yeah, that hard psychology. And that's all we had at the University of Toronto back in the uh, 1960s. That's all there was. I don't even think they'd heard of that. Well, they'd heard of psychoanalysis in order to bash it. Basically, that was it. So um, I transferred into anthropology, sociology, because at least here we were talking about people, human beings and culture and ideologies and beliefs. And, and that was of great interest to me. Um, I zeroed in on uh, the symbolic interaction tradition in social psychology, George Herbert Mead and his followers in Chicago. And I was greatly interested in that. The only trouble was they studied interaction, but only on the conscious level, not on the unconscious level. And my interest in Freud was very persisting. So I developed a critique of what my the man who was to be my mentor, Dennis Wrong, who was a prominent sociologist who taught at New York University throughout his career. He wrote a classic article in 1961 called The Over-Socialized Concept of Man in Modern Sociology. And he was what was unheard of then. He was a Freudian sociologist. 
And so I glommed onto his work and I ended up writing a PhD dissertation uh, expanding uh, on his work. Um, because in third year university, I, I learned of the existence of Eric Fromm, PhD in sociology, but also a psychoanalyst. So I learned, well, wait a minute, you can be an analyst without being a physician. And then I learned that in Toronto, they had just opened the Toronto Institute of Psychoanalysis. And then I learned that my philosophy professor was the first non-medical person trained in Canada. Um, and so I immediately decided I've got to get a PhD in sociology. I got to get an academic job and get tenure. Then I got to train at the Toronto Institute of Psychoanalysis. So I got busy, wrote the dissertation, um, cranked out some articles, managed to get tenure at York University, the second big university in Toronto. And once that was in place, I immediately applied for analytic training. I think I started in 1979. I think I graduated in about 1985. And uh, so I've been practicing since around 19, 1980. So that's how I, I got there. I, and I ended up rejoining my dad because I split with my dad when I dropped medicine. But by becoming an analyst, suddenly I'm in a physicianly role and I'm having patients and I end up being able to identify with the old man after all. Wow. So, so you, you said you split with your father. Well, I split with him in the sense that I did not follow him into medicine. I got you. And, and what was it that uh, the, the psychoanalytic side of things had that, um, that maybe sociology or, or hard psychology didn't? Well... I, I guess, you know, early on, I learned uh, as a teen that psychoanalysis was about talking to people about their lives on a very intimate level. And uh, I loved being a university teacher. I taught at a small college within the broader York University. We, the college had a separate campus, smaller classes. Um, we had a pub. Um, my students, uh, I, I was a popular teacher. After class, we'd, hang, we'd go to the pub for a beer and we'd talk about life and we'd talk about existentialism and we'd talk about psychoanalysis. And I loved all that. But, but a lot of these kids were quite troubled personally. And I wanted to talk to them on that deeper level that you cannot if you're merely an academic. You can, you can be a mentor but you can't, uh, you can't go into people's dreams. You can't go into their sex lives. That's a boundary violation if you're an academic. You know, that's playing shrink when you're not trained to be a shrink, you know. So I, I wanted to become a therapist because I wanted to talk to people on that deep, emotional, intimate level about their troubles. And I wanted to be a healer. Um, I wanted to be a healer. I... I um, I grew up in the Anglican Church. I was quite devout as a kid. I lost it all and became a passionate atheist uh, until my 40s. All my heroes were Marx, uh, Nietzsche, Freud, Sartre, all the great atheists of the West. But in my 40s, I had a reconversion. Um, uh, years, about a year around the time my father died, uh, suddenly my Christianity came back. And... Um, and Christianity is all about healing. It dovetails perfectly with the psychotherapeutic profession. We're trying to save people. And I don't, by that I don't mean bringing them to Christ. I'm not an evangelical. I'm not, I'm not using therapy as a way of converting people to Christ, Christianity. But I am in the salvation business. I'd like to save people from their neurotic repetition compulsions. Yeah, and in you have a, a fantastic YouTube channel. Uh, it'll be it'll be in the um, show notes. But in that, in one of your uh, lectures, you you mentioned how you know you're not a superstitious person, and you're, you it just ties to what you're saying about being a, an atheist, and then yeah. no longer being an atheist, and now you you can't leave your house without your your cross. <laughs> yeah, it's on right here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny how that works because. I've, I've had a very similar experience in my, in my life uh, in the last year uh, with, with the uh, away from Christianity growing up as a kid and, and back, back to it, um, kind of understanding it from a, from a different angle now. Yes, yes. 
I can't even say I can't even say I'm an atheist. The, the the latest position I've come to, and I wrote a paper about this the past year. It was supposed to be at a conference, but because of COVID, the conference was cancelled. But the paper is uh, published in a uh, in an article uh, called Vestigia. It's online, and it's called Psychoanalysis is Spirituality. Um, is the title of the paper, um, and in that paper. I say I can't call myself an atheist anymore. Um, I think I've become more truly Freudian and Kleinian because for both Freud and Klein, we are fundamentally dual. We are fundamentally divided. For Freud, conscious versus unconscious. For Klein, depressive position versus paranoid schizoid position. We are always both. We are always both Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. We're split. We're split. There is no unitary self. So I am an atheist and I am not an atheist. Um, when I'm functioning at my most rational second, well, secondary process, primary process, when I'm functioning at my mature secondary process, depressive position level, then uh, there I'm an atheist. Now, I have no, I don't like magical thinking. I have no room for superstition when I'm in that space. But I don't inhabit that space all the time. Uh, like everyone else, I oscillate back into the paranoid schizoid position. And there's a lot of good things in there. That's where passion is. That's where falling in love is. That's where uh, political, uh, deep political commitment is. And in that paranoid schizoid space, I'm something like an evangelical Christian, just without the dogma, but the passion for, for Jesus is there. I mean, on that level, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I mean, that's the way I behave. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, so I'm both. And I've learned, I'm learning, well, people say, but that's contradictory. And I say, that is Freud's message. We are contradictory. Unfortunately, Freud himself remained a bit embarrassed about this. I mean, he knew that that's what he had discovered, the split in the human mind. He knew he discovered it, but he continued to sort of imply like we ought to overcome it and become integrated. But he knew that human beings, but he remained ashamed of his own superstition. He was interested in numerology, Kabbalah, and he tried to hide it. That's why he split with Jung, you see. He projected his own superstitiousness onto Jung and then got rid of Jung. But he didn't get rid of that part of himself. He just pretended he'd gotten rid of it. Yeah, it's it's so interesting. There's so many directions we can go from this, from this. But yeah, that 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 religious uh, worldview and that that religious um, that language, like you, you know, you can use any any of the of the gods. Um, but I guess we've grown up in the Judeo Western, uh, the Judeo Christian tradition, so it's it it like it's embedded right down. Uh, in a, on an unconscious level. If you uh, spent the first 10 or 12 years of your life going to church and hearing the King James Version of the Bible and those hymns, and so it pours right into your soul. Yeah, maybe maybe tinged with a little bit of hate from uh, getting pushed to go, but... <laughs> oh yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, listen, yeah, so the topic that I wanted to get into was uh, was the mother complex or the eatable complex um and i guess to 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 frame this or to lay the groundwork uh, again in, in one of your lectures you mention uh, a literal truth versus poetic truth and yes. I, I, and i think that that might be well for me it certainly was it was the the confusion when i first came uh, cl up close to freud's ideas was taking these things literally uh, like yes. the beautiful like myths that surround us um, instead yes. of taking them for their uh, poetic truth. And would you like to explain wh what that means to you? Yeah, well, Freud himself was quite a literalist at times. And at other times, he seemed to take things more metaphorically. One of the great contributions of Jacques Lacan, who I'm very ambivalent about. I mean, I really hate the guy on one level, but I have to appreciate him on other levels. What One of his really good contributions was to thoroughly metaphorize psychoanalysis, to understand that it operates on the metaphoric level or the symbolic level, not the literal. Freud was such a literalist that he said that men cannot have penis envy because why would you envy something you've already got? And he said, women can't have castration anxiety because how could you fear losing something you never had in the first place? Of course, 
the penis envy and castration anxiety are not about the penis at all. They're about what Lacan calls the phallus, which is a symbol so that a woman's phallus might be her intellect. It could be her man. It could be her breasts. It could be her legs. Uh, and and of, it could be her beauty. So she feels castrated one day in her 30s. She sees some lines in the mirror, lines under the eyes, and, and, and that just as a man uh, comes out and he finds his new big black Mercedes Benz has been keyed right up the side of the car. Uh, ouch, uh, that's a castration. So we need to take these things on the metaphorical um, level. Uh, Freud did and did not. He, again, he was contradictory about this. So the literal Oedipus complex sounds as if a little baby wants to have sexual intercourse with his mother. And of course he does not. He doesn't even know what sexual intercourse is. Well, what does it mean then? He wants her all to himself. It's a jealousy complex. Sex can come into it and usually does come into it. Little boys get very interested in their mom's bodies. They want to peek at mom in the bathroom. They want to uh, play with her panties from her drawer. They get into it. It, it. it has a sexual aura that comes into it, but that's secondary. What's primary is I want to be the apple of her eye. I don't want her to take her eyes off me. I don't want to have her looking at dad or at my brother or sister. I want her all to myself and I get very jealous and I get very hurt and, and, and wounded when I discover that I'm not the center of her world. That's a decentering. Which, is, which all of us have to go through. And if we don't go through it, we're in trouble. Right. Yes. It's like a, a narcissism, in a way. Yes. A primary narcissism. Was that how Freud put it? Well, he, he posited a phase of primary narcissism, um, but he also posited secondary narcissism. Primary narcissism is a phase of undifferentiated oneness between the baby and the mother at the beginning we now know that that does not exist. Uh, this is one of the areas where empirical research actually forces psychoanalysis to abandon one of its uh, theses that has been invalidated empirically. I mean, the Popperians, Sir Karl Popper's followers said psychoanalysis is not a science because to qualify as a science, your, 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 your theories have to be in principle falsifiable. If there's no way you could falsify your theory, then it's not a science. And that's what he thought psychoanalysis was. But it turns out some of the postulates of psychoanalysis are falsifiable and have been falsified. And this is one of them. Primary narcissism as a stage of oneness at the beginning. The baby infant research with the cameras and, and the research, the experiments have shown that it doesn't exist. So that the B and Melanie Klein knew this all along. That was her first big disagreement with Freud. That's why she's called an object relations theorist, because there are object relations. There are re relations between the, the infant and the mother from the get go. Uh, so primary narcissism doesn't exist. Narcissism certainly exists. Uh, by, and by narcissism, what I mean is the fantasy that um, uh, I'm either the best or the worst. A lot of people don't understand that depression is a very narcissistic state. I can't talk about anything except myself, how lousy I am, how inferior I am, how inadequate, how stupid, whatever. But it's all about me. Narcissism is all about me. Um, the transcendence of narcissism is when we move into that position gradually where we begin to see that other people are real and they have feelings, often very different feelings from ours. They have views and opinions that are very different from ours. And we begin to actually care uh, in the sense of sympathy. I, I think of empathy as merely a cognitive act of putting myself in the other's shoes and getting a sense of how they feel. But psychopaths can do that. They know how you feel. They just don't give a damn how you feel. They know how you feel. <laughs> Sympathy means I know how you feel and I, I, I care. I feel your pain and I would like to relieve it. That's a different uh, act. That is a highly mature act. As we move into the depressive position, we begin to be able to care in a sympathetic way about, about other people, not just about ourselves.
And that's how it dovetail again with Christianity, of course, because Christianity is a religion of love. And it's about a religion of sacrifice, of narcissism in favor of the other. Mm. Yeah, and that links back to... to um you you mentioned how how christianity is is a wash for narcissism it's not you it's it's this entity speaking through you so that it washes you of the fear of your ego getting crushed yes um if god is with us who can be against us uh now you have to watch this it can be fanatical i mean the guys who flew the planes into the world trade center were convinced they were doing god's work so this is a scary idea, and I have a problem with Kierkegaard's uh, uh, story of Abraham and Isaac. Uh, God calls Isaac to sacrifice, uh, calls Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac, and like uh, a knight of faith, Abraham takes his son and stretches him out over the rock and is about to plunge the knife. Following God's command, God fortunately calls it off at the last moment, um, but. Uh, if that's what faith is, I don't want any part of it. Um, Abraham should have been asking himself the question, is this voice God's or is it the devil's? Uh, uh, this voice that's calling Abraham, is that me? Is it another Abraham? <laughs> I, I, I mean, there's no, we have to have a lot of uncertainty in this area. So, so uh, feeling that we are doing God's will can be a very dangerous belief. If, on the other hand, sometimes it's simply true, um, and, and when, it, when we feel it's true, we are greatly strengthened. Mm. Uh, we can even overcome the fear of death. Uh, we can sacrifice ourselves for others, uh, because the self is not that important, ultimately. What's important is, I call it conscience. You see, like in... I write in a more mostly secular way. I don't talk about the voice of Jesus in my psychoanalytic writings. I talk about the voice of conscience. For me, it's the same. For the, the Oedipus complex or, or the Oedipal complex, um, yeah. where did Freud start to put together this idea and what was he seeing? Well, I, I mean, he tells us about the trip by train from Freiburg in Moravia to Vienna when he was like three and a half, height of the Oedipal phase. And, and when the train pulled into the Strasbourg station, the station was lit up by gas lights, lamps. And um, he woke up and he looked around and there was his young mother, Amelie, she was like about 22 or 3 or 4, Jacob's third wife. Jacob was in his 40s. He's al uh, Sigmund wakes up, he's alone in the compartment with Amelie, and she's getting undressed. And there's his young mother's beautiful naked body. And then the door to the next compartment opens, and this old man, Jacob, his father, 40-something, comes in and takes... Amelie by the hand into the next compartment to do God knows what with her. It's like the dragon shows up and grabs the damsel and takes her away. And that's Freud's Oedipus complex right there. And um, later on, when he sees the performance of Oedipus Rex, he notices people coming out of the performance, uh, faces white, trembling, and he realizes this play taps into something universal in human nature. I mean, so this is how he comes to it. He comes to it on the basis of his own experience. But, you know, a lot of people superficially think, oh, well, he's just projecting his own neurotic obsession with his mother onto all mankind. No, it's not. You can't relativize it that way. He had an intense Oedipus complex, which enabled him to discover the Oedipus complex, which we all have to some degree. And I actually have a question from Reddit that feeds directly into this. By the way, you're very popular and loved on Reddit on the psychoanalysis uh, side of things over there. Oh, um, I did not know that. That's interesting. Yeah. So it's, it, it feeds directly into this uh, in uh, wondering um, how... 
Freud's inadequacy in developing a proper female psychology um, came from his uh, mother complex? Well, I don't know whether that came from his Oedipus complex per se, but it certainly had something to do with his mother. I mean, um, there's a wonderful little book by an analyst by the name of Deborah Margolis, um, and it's called Freud and His Mother. And uh, she looks at all of the evidence, and the evidence indicates that uh, Freud's mother was a very narcissistic woman. Um, and her way of relating to Sigmund was as um, a piece of herself that she was very proud of. My son, the famous Dr. Freud, um, did she even see him as an individual? Or did she just bask in the glory he brought her? Um, Margolis thinks that Freud unconsciously deeply hated his mother, but could never admit it. And there's a lot of evidence for this. For example, in one of his statements, he says, all human relationships that reach any depth are ambivalent. Wherever we love, we also hate. Except, he says, in a mother's relationship with her son. He makes that an exception. And he's not he religious. <laughs> Sorry? And he's not religious, he said. <laughs> and he's not religious, yeah. Yeah, he exempts the mother. Um, he can't face it. He can't face his hatred for his mother. And, of course, that hatred for his mother affects his psychology of women. Um, you know, he devalues them. He sees them as castrated. Um he doesn't just describe their belief that lacking a penis means they're castrated. He says when they discover that they lack a penis, that's okay so far. Girls discover they lack a penis. That's fine. I.e., he says, when they discover their castration, no, that doesn't follow. Discovering that you lack a penis is not the discovery that you are castrated. You're not castrated. You never had a penis. In fact, you don't need a penis. Oh, one of the great things that happened to me as a university teacher is I, I've been teaching this stuff for years. Uh, a student came with a cartoon. God knows where she found it. Two frames. In both frames, there's a little boy and a little girl, about three and a half or four. They've both dropped their pants. And in the frame one, he's pointing at his penis. And he's saying, ha, ha, ha. I've got one of these. And you don't. Frame two. She's pointing at her vulva, and she's saying, ha, 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 with one of these, I can get as many of those as I want. Okay, that's femininity. Um, that's healthy femininity. Who needs a penis? Why would anyone want it? You could get it caught in a door jam. You could get it caught in a drawer. Why, it, it flops around. What, what's the point? I don't need it. I can attract them. Camille Paglia as well had a, a great um, take on this, where, where she she said that basically all of all of man and, and societies is is a is a is a defense against the the the, the female like uh, yeah I don't know how you'd put it but well, yeah the power the power of the of the unconscious the pre edible mother I mean because the breast is everything. Uh, but this was repeated in the history of Western civilization. The, the, uh, before the gods of Olympus, the male gods, Zeus, before that, Freud knew this. He, he talked about how if you dig down into one of those Italian towns, the first thing you come upon are the relics of the Greco-Roman, which was a patriarchal civilization with father gods. But if you keep digging... You come down to an earlier civilization, the Minoan Mycenaean civilization, which worshipped female deities. And he knew that the human psyche echoes this. Our first pre edible layer is all about the breast mother. And he said to him as a man, it was all dark and shadowy. He said it will be the women analysts who tell us about this. And he was right. Melanie Klein, Anna Freud, many other women analysts uh, taught us about this pre edible Lair where the deity is the mother. This is echoed in Catholic uh, worship of the Blessed Virgin Mary, of course. Um, um, but during this pre edible period, uh, without mother, we die. 
It's that simple. Um, the breast is everything. Um, Donald Meltzer and, and some of his followers have the idea that when the baby emerges and sees the mother, the baby is overcome with awe at the beauty of the mother. And uh, there's evidence from a lot of the early analysts, the so-called Isaac Hour phenomenon. When we fall asleep, it's like there's this round spherical object that is coming towards us and we kind of fall into it and go to sleep. Well, that's the breast. That's a memory, a dim memory of the early um, Bertram Levine writes about the baby's wish to eat and to be eaten and to fall asleep, which is to be absorbed into the mother. Um, that's the wish to sleep, to be absorbed into the breast mother. This is this mother image is powerful. Uh, Freud knew that it existed. He talked about um, the Medusa, the woman with the snake's hair. And apparently Athena had that Medusa image painted on her shield. And when she went into battle, she would hold up the shield and male warriors would see the head of the Medusa and they would drop their spears and run because the multiplication of penises means the absence of a penis. So holding up that shield was a direct threat of castration. Men are afraid of the pre mother because, you know, you were a tiny little boy and there was this all-powerful female uh, who you adored and feared and uh, look, I've worked with many men. Um, it took me a long time personally to overcome my fear. I was involved in a hiring process at the university, just as um, uh, the, the hiring that would favor women applicants was about to come in. It wasn't in. And we got a short list with four women and one man. I was chair of my department. Uh, we all wanted to hire a woman because we had many women students and we wanted a woman professor as a role model. But unfortunately, the one man who applied and got on the short list was just vastly superior academically to any of the women. He would published a bunch of books. He was a excellent teacher. You know, the I would not have had to vote. But the department split four for the woman, four for the man. As chair, I have to break the tie. I voted for the man. I hired him. <laughs> Shit hit the fan. The <laughs> women's studies department went crazy. And the head of the women's studies department had the Medusa hair. And she was uh, a man hater. And she certainly became a Carvet hater. And she went to war. And she stimulated all my pre anxiety about the castrating pre mother. Fortunately, I was in analysis. Four days a week, I lay down on my analyst couch, and I, he helped me stop being afraid. Uh, he helped me so that I can stand up to women now. Uh, now, there's all these men who can stand up to other men. If, if, if in a business deal, a man tries to uh, fleece them in some way, they have no trouble, you know, protecting themselves against predatory men. But they fall apart in the face of a predatory woman unless they resolve this pre mother complex. And, and wh what is it uh, in, in your experience uh, that causes this this to to manifest in the world in, in um, your patients uh, and and then you mentioned as well you got over that and, and how what was that process like well i mentioned my analyst helping me overcome it he was a tall x r a f fighter a, a bomber pilot and uh and he'd spent time in a prisoner of war camp and, and, and then he, uh, when he got out of that, he went to England and trained in medicine, psychiatry, and psychoanalysis in London. Then he came to Canada. He was a very admirable, very strong man. He was chief of psychiatry here in Toronto, and I was privileged to lie on his couch four days a week. 
So uh, here I'm going to go Lacanian. This is another big contribution of Lacan, paternal function. What is the function of the father? To free the son from his mother. Now, we hate him for coming between us and our mother, and we love him for coming between us and our mother. Okay, on the one hand, we're jealous. He gets to do all kinds of things with her that we can't do. And we hate him for that, and we're jealous, and we're envious. But he grabs us and takes us out. And, um, you know, he will say to the woman, leave the boy alone. Uh, give the boy a break. Come with me, son. We're out of here. Uh, we're going to go kick a football around, or we're going to go to the hockey game. Um, okay, that's emancipation from the mother. And if that man can stand up to that woman, and I don't mean dominate her. This is I'm not celebrating patriarchy. This is not about dominating women. But if this man has the strength to be the equal of his wife, a democratic equal, so he can say no to his wife. And the little boy says, hmm, he's not afraid of mommy, apparently. Huh, mommy doesn't dominate him. Hmm. Um, he doesn't dominate mommy. He doesn't have to dominate mommy because he doesn't, he's not afraid of mommy. Therefore, he doesn't have to dominate her. Okay, and this, this is freeing the boy from being dominated by women or having to dominate women. He's learning that a woman can be your equal. I mean, it took me many. I went to a boys prep school. <sighs> uh, kids who go to high schools where they have female friends, they, they learn much earlier than I did that the secret is that women are just people. They're just people. And there's good ones and there's bad ones and there's indifferent ones. They come in all stripes. All types, some are bad, some are wonderful. I, I, I was in my 40s or 50s before I was really getting this. I read the article you sent me about the mother complex in Ireland, and I've long known that that is a particular problem in, in Ireland. It's a problem in many countries. Ireland is not alone with this problem, but, but Ireland seems to have it in spades. When the Catholic Church dominates as heavily as it has in Ireland, I think it's even because what are priests there? They are men who I don't want to offend priests here. Priests are many things. OK, but the vow of celibacy, not that it's practiced actually that much. But the point is, the vow of celibacy is that like I am voluntarily castrating myself. In a certain level, on a certain level, I am not going to father children, although many of them did. But the point is, I'm not going to father children. Um, I'm going to they're going to call me father. But I'm not really going to be a father in a biological sense. What is it? That's quite a sacrifice. Um, and that's a devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, um, like, the, like, like nuns who become brides of Christ. They don't become brides of men. Yeah, I think you need a psychoanalytic anthropologist historian to sort out, you know, to sort out the various elements of it, but there's one important element you didn't mention, primogeniture. The eldest son waits forever. He doesn't marry. He waits to inherit the farm, to inherit the land. Um, the younger sons leave home. Um, that's a factor. Uh, I can't say more about it. I, 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 soci other sociologists have written about this important factor of the primogeniture and its effect on the family structure and on these men who don't marry until they're in their 50s. Only then have they inherited the, fa the farm, whatever. Um, and why is that? Is that is that because they, they don't develop uh, that, that uh, masculine spirit, say, by, by spreading their wings in the world? Well, they're not they're not able to spread their wings because they're dependent on uh, they're going to inherit the farm. They have to wait around and take care of the farm and take care of the aging parents, and they're not free to marry until they inherit the farm. Up until uh, until they inherit, they're just a farmhand who can't really leave the farm. And you say marry uh, as you know. It, 
that's that's a, a I suppose a, a physical uh, symbol of, of moving forward in life. You can you can still be married and you can still be stuck as the as the eternal child. You can still be oh, stuck yeah, stuck sure, yeah. as as you can unholy matrimony. You can still be oh, st- stuck oh, back as as a child. Yeah. So many men, so many men are married, and um, but they are living castrated uh, existences, um, subordinated, mocked. Um, it's very interesting. My wife is an American. Um, when she was here in Canada with me for a few years, she remarked on the television ads. In many Canadian TV ads, uh, the mother and the children, including boys, but very often the daughters, they're smiling and rolling their eyes at fool dad. Okay? They're, sh- they're, they're sharing looks of Dad, that's dad. He's being mocked in these ads. And I thought, uh, she said, well, they don't have, we don't have ads like that in the United States. I thought, oh, come on, no, that's not true. You must, you must. I have a patient who is a film, he works in the film industry. He's a cameraman. I asked him about this. He said, oh, in the film industry, the ad industry in Canada, we all know this. We talk about it all the time. This laughing at dad, that's Canadian ads. The Americans do that far less. Well, now the Americans pay pay a price for their strange kind of masculinity, which involves guns. And now storming the bloody capital. I mean, you know, I'm not saying American masculinity is so immature. Uh, It's like they got stuck in some sort of phallic phase. Like, these Canadian ads show a father who is not capable of being a fully phallic guy. The Americans are exaggeratedly phallic. And that's not really grown up either. I mean, a, a, a truly masculine grown up man doesn't strut around uh, like a Nazi. Uh, and he doesn't, you know, cling to his gun to prove he's a man. He's got a quiet confidence. All right. Um, he's able to say yeah. no. He's capable to say of saying no to his children and to his wife and to himself. You see, and to himself. Uh, in order to be able to say no to yourself, which means having self-control, discipline, to say no to yourself. I'd like to have that second drink and that third drink, and I wouldn't mind having that woman, but no. <laughs> I'm not I'm not doing that. Uh, I'm the captain of my ship and I'm saying no to these temptations. Um, now, to be able to do that, you have to have had a father who could say no to you. And to his wife, your mother. And so you've been able to identify and internalize his capacity to say no. I mean, I think the ability to say no is connected to the ability to say. See, you're talking about the podcast being part of your own um, project of becoming more articulate, Um, but there was no no in your family. The absence of the word no, there's something about words, there's something about language. Here again, Lacan got something right. There's something, that's part of the way psychoanalysis works you're making an effort to put everything into speech. And putting everything into speech intrinsically involves saying no, because it involves making distinctions between this and that. Oh, let me clarify. When I said that, I didn't really mean that. No, that's not exactly what I meant was this. Well, you see, there's a no there. No, I didn't mean that. I'm clarifying. I mean this. And so if you're lying on a couch for several years, talking, making distinctions, you're saying no a lot. You're learning how to say no. You know who's brilliant on this is Jean-Paul Sartre, who's underappreciated these days. I mean, Sartre says that consciousness operates uh, through what he calls nihilation, nihilating. What does he mean? By, he says, placing a nothingness. Man is the being who brings nothingness into the world. Um, in order to know this cup, I have to know that I 
am not the cup. So I'm placing a nothingness, a gap, a cut between me as subject and the cup as object. Okay. And then secondly, to know the cup, I have to not only put a nothingness between me and the cup, but I have to put a nothingness between the cup and the table it is sitting on. And human consciousness pours nothingness out into the world in this way. That is, it operates by distinguishing this from that. Uh, R.D. Lang, uh, the Scottish uh, psychiatrist, was very influenced by Sartre. And uh, in his little book, Knots, he says, um, um, uh, 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 um, all, um, all, 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 all mind, no, all mind is distinguishing, uh, no distinctions, no mind. So I, I guess this is a, a nice place to, to kind of move to winning or losing this the Oedipal situation. It seems like it's something that you oscillate back and forth between. It's not something you ever get over fully. No, uh, but I would make the point that when you win, you lose. And when you lose, you lose. In other words, uh, we're all Oedipal losers. It can't, you can't win. Uh, because if you win, you live with the lifelong sense of guilt and the need to punish yourself for defeating your father and your siblings because you were mommy's little darling. Uh, you are king of the castle which means you, you're left feeling you've killed your father and your siblings. And because of that, what you take to be a crime, you have to punish yourself. So you're busy clutching defeat from the jaws of victory, sabotaging yourself one way or another, getting into relationships with people who will torture you because you deserve torture, you believe, you feel. So the price of winning um, is terrible. Uh, if you lose, you're left feeling like a loser. Um, maybe it's better to lose. Um, maybe that's easier to cope with than winning. I think winning is a disaster. Winning is a disaster. Um, I guess there's many different ways of losing. There's the, there's the normal, relatively normal, way of losing, uh, you begin to realize that dad has privileges with mom that you don't have. You envy him, you hate him. But on the other hand, he teaches you how to ride a bicycle <laughs> and he takes you to watch the Maple Leafs. And um, um, so you come to forgive him or you come to, he's a pretty good guy and you try to overcome your, and one day you'll get one of your own. And um uh, he did liberate you from mom. Um, okay, that's pretty healthy. That's pretty healthy. Yeah, you lost. In a certain way, you lost. But you lost to a man you love. Uh, you lost to a man you love and who has been good to you and good for you. And, oh, Harold Searles uh, wrote a wonderful article on this. Uh, he's The healthy resolution... You come to have um, respect for what mother and father have together. They seem to love each other. They seem to need each other. Okay, I'll let dad have her. Uh, he needs her. Um, there's something, uh, something holy in their connection, holy matrimony. Um, I respect it. I respect their bond. It excludes me on a certain level, uh, but I respect it. Um, that's mature. That's health. I don't know how many of us actually get to that. Freud did believe that you could get to a healthy place if everything went perfectly right. Well, you could read him that way. I don't know. You could also read him in a more existential way. Uh, I... I Maybe you're right. I don't know. I, I don't know how to answer that. I prefer the existentialist reading. I, Freud was pretty committed to a tragic sense of life. I don't think he would have said that, actually. If you put that directly to him, I think he would have said it's much more complicated than that. That, that implies too much social determinism for Freud. 
that uh, if society got it right, if parents got it right, we'd all be happy. No, that's more post-Freudian. That's more like relational psychoanalysis and self-psychology. Uh, they believe, they're really into a social determinism, even Fairbairn. Um, um, uh, they think that if only the parents were, were healthy, and if only they raised their children in an enlightened and healthy way, all would be well. No way. I did a video recently called The Sins of the Fathers, and I pointed out in that video, well, that's where I pointed out that uh, uh, good parents sometimes have really bad kids, and bad parents sometimes have really good kids. So clearly, it's not just the quality of the parenting that shapes who we are. Of course, there's the biological constitutional hereditary factors, there's that, there's also luck, randomness. You've got these lousy parents who are drunk and drug addicted and whatever, but you meet this teacher or you meet this priest or this coach. Hopefully he's not an abuser, uh, but you get something. For, or you've got a grandmother. Yeah, you only see her three or four times a year because she lives in another town, but you do see her. And she reaches out to you and she gives you something that you could never get at home. And you remember that something and you learn to look for it. And maybe you meet some woman who, like your grandmother, gives that something to you. And um, these are very complicated, random kinds of factors. But uh, and then and then there's decisions. You know, you make a bad decision and it leads you down a very bad path, or you make a good decision for whatever reason and it leads you in a very positive path. So no, it cannot all be laid at the door of good or bad parenting. No, it can't. Something else about the Oedipus complex because I really disagree with Freud and the Freudians their idea of the healthy resolution. Uh, uh, Freud writes as if the healthy resolution is the boy uh, has so much castration anxiety for he's desiring dad's woman and if dad finds out dad is going to castrate me and I'm now full of anxiety. I'm also full of guilt because secretly I'm hating dad and wanting his woman and the guilt and the anxiety is so overwhelming at a certain point the boy just throws in the towel and he says, uncle, I'll submit to dad. I'll give, let, let him have mom. I'll surrender my desire, my incestuous desire for mother and submit to the paternal law. And that is supposed to be health. That is not health. That is driven into a submission by castration fear. That's highly neurotic, that resolution. And I'm afraid that type of resolution has been celebrated by the Freudians. I mean, joining the psychoanalytic society is like joining a boys club. We've all knuckled under to the patriarch. And this is how we preserve patriarchy. We belong to the club. We're all circumcised. I'm not referring to the Jewish practice here, but symbolically, it's like we've all given away a bit of our masculinity and knuckled under to the father figure. And that's what it is to be a mature man, say some Freudians. Well, no, that is not the resolution. There are a few of us who take another route. I'm talking about the great Hans Lowald. I'm talking about my mentor, Eli Sagan. I'm talking about myself. Uh, we say the real resolution of the Oedipus complex is to kill your father and marry your mother symbolically. Kill him symbolically. How do I kill my father symbolically? By growing up and by becoming a man of my own right. That's how I kill him. I'm, he's dead already. I'm going on. I haven't literally killed him, but I have um, stepped out from under his shadow and his control. I have. Uh, he said no to me. I say no to him on a certain level. I love him, but I'm my own man now. Okay, symbolically, that's kind of killing your father, symbolically. Uh, and having your mother, you don't literally have your mother, you don't literally have incest with your mother, but you get a woman who you desire as you desired your mother. 
Uh, now, speaking personally, my wife happens to be the spitting image of my mother <laughs> at an earlier age. Uh, but she's not my mother. She's a fellow psychoanalyst. She's my wife. She's not my mother. But it's kind of like I get my mother symbolically after all, which is, of course, what I wanted. Uh, so I didn't get the real literal thing, but I got a pretty good symbolic substitute. Um, that's the resolution. That's what health looks like. It's not this sacrificial surrender. Are you still seeing clients right now? In, in your experience, have you ever had uh, or can you paint a picture of a situation like this? Well, in recent, in recent years, a lot of men in their 40s, uh, late 40s, early 50s, um, have been coming to me. These are pretty successful men, but they their first marriages were not good and not happy. Um, and um, they, 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 they've been unhappy for years. They've put up with a lot of domination, exploitation, uh, inadequate sex life. They've put up with all of this, um, trying to be good boys and knuckling under to mother. Um, anyway, by the time they get into their late 40s, early 50s, they're pretty fed up. Um, and uh, they, want, they want out. Um, and a lot of them come to me when they're already mostly out or already out of that marriage. And now they're starting to date. And you wouldn't believe how they go from the frying pan into the damn fire. The women they start to date are far worse than the wife they just left. They're more castrating. They're more exploiting. They're more whatever. Um, and so they come to see me and they tell me about their latest date and they're starting to date this woman and they're telling me these stories, these horror stories, and I'm helping them see how they've gone from the frying pan into the fire and I'm helping extricate them from the fire. And so, you know, he fires that girlfriend and now we're on to girlfriend number two and she looks pretty good at the beginning but after a month or so, something emerges there that sure isn't right, and I help him get out of that. And then very often, girlfriend three, four, or five, they find a sweetie. They find a good woman, a warm, loving, kind woman, not a submissive woman. I'm thinking of this one guy. He, fall, he fell in love with this sweet woman. She had a business of her own. She had raised her kids from her previous marriage for a certain number of years on her own while running her business. And she was warm. She was careful. She was cautious because she was checking him out as much as he was checking her out. And they finally got together and they got married. And that was the end of the therapy. Satisfied customer. So, you know, I find like I do a fair amount of that, that work because these guys are caught in a repetition. They got involved with um, a domineering a uh, woman in the first place because of their mother complex. And even when they get out of that, they start to repeat it again. Mm. And why do you think that happens? Why, and why do you think that is? And I suppose so just to preface it a little bit is, uh, I, I notice myself, um, well, after the fact, usually, uh, that I get very activated uh, when, uh, when particularly family members try and do things for me or or tell me what to do so i, I can see there that i'm i'm kind of fighting for a, de, a, a dependence independence I'm, I'm fighting out of a dependent mind frame i get very right. activated by by that yeah well it feels like home why why does this guy having gotten rid of one mother substitute why does he start to get involved with another because these women it feels like home you know we for uh, attachment theory it's like we uh, like the baby chick that pecks its way out of the egg and the first thing it sees is the mother duck and it imprints. And so we have imprinted and we tend to repeat 
Um, so, you know, this guy goes to a party and there are 20 women there and uh, 19 of them are sweet and one is a total bitch. Who does he come home with? You know, it feels like home. Uh, okay, so he, you, you could say he's an addict. And what's going on there uh, in the in the interactions and in the micro behaviors that that attracts a person uh, to well, the same situation? There's, there's an element of masochism. Um, uh, he gets he he uh, on some level he gets a little bit excited at being beaten. Um, he he's attracted to the struggle. This woman gives him an opportunity to fight the fight he always fought or that he never fought, but he needed to fight with his mother. Okay, okay, this one, I'm going to take this one on, and I'm going, this is the taming of the shrew. Okay, uh, 19 wi nice women at the party, I found the shrew. I took her home because I'm going to tame her. I never could tame my mother, but I'm going to tame this one. That can be a motive. Or this one's going to flagellate me and I'm going to get thrilled masochistically by getting beaten up by this woman. Uh, I'm excited by the struggle. Um, maybe this time I can make the struggle come out differently. Maybe I can change history. Maybe I can make change history and come out a winner this time instead of a loser. OK, these normal women don't give me an opportunity for such an exciting struggle. Uh, besides, I can't accept this nice woman because I don't deserve nice woman. I'm bad. I deserve beating. Here's a woman who's going to beat me. That's what I need. Multiple factors. Yeah, multiple factors. And yeah, it, it's it's so easy to, to want to pin something down on, on just one, one, uh, yeah. one issue and then drill that home. Well, that's why analysis takes time. It's why it's a not a, a quick treatment. That's why I don't believe in time-limited therapies or short-term therapies. Forget it. Um, it took years to build this neurosis, you know, and it's going to take a number of years to resolve it. And what would you say to the person that, that comes and says, uh, well, you're just making money off, the, off this person. You're, that's what you're doing, and you're enjoying it. Uh, I would say... That's probably quite true of some charlatan therapists. It's true. There are such charlatan therapists out there. Um, I'm not one of them. Um, how can the patient know that? The patient can't know that until they get to know me. Um, you know, when you sit down with a therapist, you're taking a severe risk. There are a lot of ill-trained therapists there are a lot of uh, sociopathic therapists. Um, he's got a degree hanging on the wall. So what? You have to test the therapist to find out what he or she is really made of. You hope that you find. So, you know, you, you need to check out the, the therapist's reputation. Have you, have you talked to people that have been treated by him? What are people saying about him? What kind of reputation does he have? You walk into a therapist who's an unknown quantity, you could be walking into Dr. Hannibal Lecter's office. That would be no fun. <laughs> <laughs> or it might be if, you, if, you, if you're that way inclined. If you like having your head open and your brain eaten, uh, yeah, if you're into that. <laughs> Uh, but listen, I have a, a another question here. He's wondering how to deal with an overbearing mother and how that would affect his current romantic relationship and what should he be aware of and how might he conduct himself uh, in order to make sure that that repetition, I guess, doesn't happen again. Well, uh, I think he has to be, he should be open to his girlfriend's view of the matter because if the girlfriend is at all sane and normal, she will want a man who is not dominated by his mother. Um, she will want a man who is able to say, bye mother, this is my woman now. This is the woman I'm concerned about now. Don't 
intervene, don't intrude, be happy for me that I'm leaving you. I mean, I, I like the symbolism of the father walking the daughter up the aisle and giving her away to another man. Okay, mothers should also walk up the aisle and give their, their sons away to another woman, but they often really don't. They try to cling. They try to compete with, with their, their, their uh, daughter-in-law. Uh, they, they don't let the guy go. And the guy maybe didn't have a, enough of a strong father to be able to say no to the mother and leave the mother. This drives the girlfriend or the wife crazy. She's not really his wife. She's not really his wife until he can say no to his mother. From my observations of, of many of families and family situations, I'm just seeing this, um, this lack of the masculine spirit and the, the no. Like, I see it everywhere. Well, it is everywhere. I think it's a real problem. Yeah, I think it's a real problem. I think something happened uh, in our society. Uh, what is it? I mean, sociologically, a lot, some sociologists talk about, you know, the shift from the agrarian society where the son saw the father at work all day long on the farm. He knows what the father does. He knows how father can shoe a horse. He knows how father can plow a field. Uh, father is skilled and son learns the skills from the admired father. Uh, okay, in the modern uh, capitalist uh, corporate society, father leaves early in the morning with a briefcase to get on a train and he comes back late. At, you haven't got a clue what he does all day long. Um, he's absent. You don't know what he does. This is undermining. So I think there's widespread problems with, with masculinity in this respect. Well, uh, unfortunately, some men, in order to stand up and assert themselves, they do this in a toxic masculine way instead of a healthy masculine way, right? I mean, they build up their muscles and they become loud and they become aggressive and... Um, uh, they become soldier-like, and they become domineering, and they want to dominate women. Um, that's toxic masculinity. And, um, you know, I, I think the society encourages that to a certain degree. I think the corporate world, to, in certain ways, um, certainly the military, um, the problems we see with police forces around the world. I, I'm, this, this is, a, this is a, a toxic vision of masculinity as a bully. You know, that's terrible. That's not what a real man is. A, a real man stands up to bullies. And a real man uh, protects women and children from bullies. Uh, so you got to sort this out. I mean, if you come out of childhood feeling dominated and castrated and weak, you could easily go for the he-man notion of masculinity and try to become that, to overcome your weakness, right? You wind up with this toxic masculine idea as opposed to healthy masculinity. Yeah, and then like with respect to how subjugated women were for the thousands of years i guess it, it, it's like you know it's understandable that this is just like a dialectical reaction to how they were treated yeah yeah absolutely there's a swing a swing and now the man is castrated and the women are phallic um and uh maybe dialectically uh, we get to a third thing uh, that would be the goal where the woman doesn't need to be phallic and the man isn't phallic and they can form a, a, an egalitarian partnership with one another. She doesn't have to dominate him. He doesn't have to dominate her. Two rational people who can be in love and work out a life together. Uh, but yeah, you're right. It's a, it's a swing to, to uh, a pathological state. 
My wife uh, has strong views about this because on, on one level, of course, she's a feminist, equal pay for equal work and the injustice and the violence against women and everything else. But but she also celebrates um, what she sees as uh, genuine femininity, which is a position of strength, uh, which can be receptive and nurturing um, and strong. And, um, you know, I mean, we need to break down the stereotypes, mothering, fathering. I mean, what we need is strong, good parenting, which a man, a, a, a healthy man ought to be able to be maternal and a healthy woman ought to be pat, able to be paternal. But we got to stop calling it maternal and paternal. What we're really talking about is parenting, good parenting. Uh, sometimes good parenting involves setting limits, and sometimes it means being nurturant and receptive, uh, both on the part of a man and a woman who does this, right? It's the same thing with therapists. Some therapists are way too, um, uh, they're way too lenient, soft, as if you can cure through love and kindness alone. No. A good therapist has to be kind, but has to also be strong. Uh, has to be able to say no. Um, uh, has to be able to, to speak the truth to the patient, sometimes bluntly. Uh, sometimes you have to say, I'm sorry, if you continue to do that, I will not work with you any further. Stop that immediately, or this therapy is over. You have one last chance. If you do that again, I will not work with you any longer. And actually following through with that and actually, oh, actually getting them out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've yeah. warned you and you've gone ahead and do this. Uh, I'll give you the name of a referral service so you can find another therapist, but I can't work with you any longer. I mean, uh, Otto Kernberg will not allow himself to be hamstrung by suicidal patients who are going to try to keep the threat of suicide to keep him on the edge of his chair. Uh, he says, um, look, if you make a suicide attempt and you call me, I'll do my, my best to call the police, call 911, call an ambulance. But understand that when you do that, the therapy ends that day. There's no more therapy between us. I'll try to save your life, but that's the end of the therapy. So don't go threatening me with suicide. Okay. Yeah. And, and that's, understandably to would that be to protect himself really because that's so destabilizing yeah, because you, you got to be able to think clearly you got to be able to be free to uh, to be a therapist if if you're terrified that if you say some truth to the patient they're going to off themselves how are you going to do therapy that feeds back into this whole um kind of uh softening of of culture and then that feels back into the into the um the absence of a n of no and the fault masculine spirit exactly. in society exactly like kernberg uh, he tells one incident he has this woman patient who uh, chronically refuses to leave the session at the end of the session so you know uh, the next day she comes for her session and she notices that standing outside uh, the door are two six foot five men in white uniform. And he tells her that if she refuses to leave the room at the end of the session, he will press a buzzer and these guys will come in and carry her out. That's real hardball. I don't, I don't actually play that way. I don't play such a hard game as that. But uh, there's a sense in which I admire the clarity of it. What are you up to now? Um, what are you up to? What, what's keeping you most busy and most interested? Um, well, by mistake, I sent you uh, a paper I'm work. I sent you the title and the, a description, right, of a paper I'm working on. Uh, the there's a group of uh, I think they're Division Thirty Nine of the American Psychological Association. Their group in Chicago, CCAP, I think they're called. Um, uh, analytical uh, psychotherapy group. Uh, they asked me to speak to them. I'm going to be speaking to them in February. And uh, so I think the title was uh, Dreaming, Fantasy, and Awakening in Psychoanalysis. 
So that's kind of what I'm thinking about and working on now. Um, the idea of sleep and dreaming and unconscious fantasy. I think that uh, uh, Bertram Levine pointed out that we could have theorized psychoanalysis that way, but instead we theorized it in terms of neurotic conflict and conflicting forces in the mind. Um, I think he has a really good point, and it would, it's still useful to try to uh, think about psychoanalysis in the language of dreams, sleeping, and awakening. Um, I think of psychoanalysis as a type of meditation, and like all meditative traditions, the aim of meditation is to help us wake up. All of the Eastern religions see us as caught in what they call the veil of maya, which is the veil of illusion. And, and psychotherapy should be a disillusioning experience. On the other hand, you have to qualify that. Some people come to therapy already so disillusioned. Uh, sometimes therapy helps them find an illusion. Uh, hopefully not an illusion, hopefully a truth. But, um, um, but I think it, it's useful to think of neurotics as walking around in a dream that they don't know is a dream you know, or, or walking around in a fantasy, spelt with a PH like the Kleinians do, walking around in a fantasy that they, they, they don't know is a fantasy. They, they confuse fantasy and reality. This is very Kleinian. The Kleinian ther therapy has always been a matter of trying to acquaint, help a patient become acquainted with the fantasies that live him, that unconsciously drive him. And, and then when you become aware that you're driven by a fantasy, and you're aware that it is a fantasy, well, that's awakening. And in Eastern thought, those who have achieved enlightenment are referred to as the awakened ones. Okay, so we're trying to help people wake up, but we do it in an odd way. We do it by putting them to sleep. We invite them to lie down in a dimly lit, quiet room. And we don't since we abandoned hypnosis, we don't literally put them to sleep, but we invite them to go into a kind of a dreamy state called free association, and we ourselves go into a certain kind of a dreamy state called freely hovering attention, and we pay attention, you know, in, in an odd way. We diffuse our attention. It's not a focused attention. We diffuse it over everything that happens. I mean, I'm I'm interested in how the patient comes into the room. Well, he forgot his glasses. He always wears his glasses to the sessions, but today on the, on the way over to the session, he noticed he'd left his glasses at home. It was too late to walk all the way back, so he came without his glasses. Then he presents a dream, and in the dream, he's about to get into a fist fight with someone, and before getting into the fist fight, he's taking off his glasses. Well, clearly he came to get into a fight with the analyst. So he walked in, walked in a dream to the analyst. He'd taken off his glasses in advance of coming to the analyst's office. Clearly he's in a fantasy about some big fight that he wants or feels he needs on some level to have or is having with the analyst. And what would you say to playing devil, devil's advocate someone just says well you know dreams aren't real they're just they're just they just happen they just happen this doesn't have anything to do with my waking life what, what you're talking about right now well i invite him to be in analysis with me for a few months and he'll change his mind i will show him how relevant his dreams are to his life i mean Someone who doesn't know and has never been in psychotherapy, they're not entitled to an opinion. Uh, really, they haven't looked at the evidence. Um, you know, uh, and, and besides, where does he think the dreams come from? He's the author of the dreams. No one else is writing the dream. It's his dream. He created it. And, and uh, there is uh, Freud brilliantly discovered a great deal about the whole meaning and function and how to understand dreams. Um, I think you have to be in therapy to learn that. 
or you have to be a very self-reflective person. I think someone could make a study of their dreams without actually being an analysis. They could conduct a self-analysis. It would be a very limited analysis because Freud's joke is the counter-transference, the analyst's love for the patient is too strong. Okay, so I'm not going to get far with my self-analysis. I love myself too much. Uh, I'm going to go easy on myself. I'm not going to want to look at the hard bit. There's a danger in opening oneself up when you're on your own. Nietzsche um, says something somewhere. He says, um, 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 if you look into the abyss, don't forget the abyss also looks into you, he says. Um, okay, if you're going to explore the abyss, you should tie a rope around your waist before you climb down, and you should have a good, strong friend up above connected to the rope. That's the analyst. I don't, it can be dangerous to muck about with self-analysis on your own without a trained and reliable therapist. Okay. And, and wasn't Jung, Jung, he said it, he used his family as his ground uh, yeah. and, and, and his practice as his ground. I, I didn't think of that now, how, how it might actually be dangerous on your own. Yeah, I think it can be. And I, I think he got himself into a certain amount of trouble. I mean, there are people who look at that and think, well, you know, he was psychotic uh, at, at times in certain ways. Um, I think I think. Even with an analyst, you can get into trouble with analysis. You can open up things that can be overwhelming. Uh, but on the other hand, to ignore the dreams, the dreams are trying to tell you something. Um, you know, uh, Kierkegaard says anxiety and depression are messages from the soul that something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Uh, something is wrong in your life. And, and the anxiety and the depressive states are trying to tell you that. And if you ignore them or you make them go away with pharmaceuticals, um, you're, 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 you're kind of like um, getting rid of the messenger and you're not getting the message. I, see, I, I imagine that as how I've imagined it uh, and tried to get it across metaphorically is, is you're suppressing uh, like an impending tsunami. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So better better to not suppress it. On the other hand, better not mess around with it in an amateurish way because that might just provoke the tsunami. Uh, I mean, you know, I think being with a trained professional, I mean an experienced, <laughs> people ask me, you know, what's the best kind of therapist to get? I say, Get some old guy or woman who's been at this for many years, but make sure that they're not yet sliding into dementia. <laughs> There's, you got to get them in that sweet spot, the sweet spot where they have decades of experience and decades to achieve wisdom, but they haven't start, started to lose it yet. <laughs> Fine line. <laughs> It's a fine line. <laughs> my God, my God. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, it was fantastic chatting with you. And uh, I, I just have one question for you here. Um, sure. It is, if you were... How do I pronounce your name? Yeah, it's a hard one, isn't it? Uh, it's Adon. Adon. If you were starting over again, knowing all that you know now, um, what advice would you give that bright-eyed version of yourself? Huh, what advice would I give? Well... I wouldn't, I wouldn't have, I don't think, I think it was right for me to get out of pre-meds. A part of me would like to have stayed in meds and then become who I am now anyway. But the only way I became who I am now was by getting out of meds. But I, I, I would like to be a psychiatrist as well as a psychoanalyst because then I would be able to hospitalize patients. I would be able to visit them and work with them in hospital I would be able to prescribe medication, which I would rarely do, but in the case of psychosis, I certainly probably would. Um, um, I, I, would, I, would I would enjoy having that as an add-on. On the other hand, by turning away from medicine and following social and philosophical studies, I bring a whole 
series of perspectives to bear on psychoanalysis that I would not have if I had done the straight medical path. So I would lose much. I might gain a bit, but I might lose much. Um, what else? Well, um, I don't know that I would have done anything too diff much differently. I learned the different schools of thought. I, I gave myself, I came as a, began as a Freudian. I then started reading uh, um, the American object relations people. Then I got to Harry Gundrip and from him I got to Winnicott and to Fairbairn. And then, oh, okay, I would get to Klein much earlier. I would get to Melanie Klein much earlier. I found my way back to Klein after Gun Trip, Fairbairn, Winnicott. Then I got back to Klein. I would go right to Klein. I would do Freud, and then I would go right to Klein. And 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 I wouldn't stay with classic Klein. I'd bring up to the modern Kleinians of London, the Betty Joseph um, uh, people, the Ronald Britton people. Um, John Steiner, those modern London Kleinians are very good, but classic, but more important than them is Melanie Klein herself. She's so important. She's right next to Freud, but she needs to be complimented with Winnicott and Bowlby. And wh why, why is that, do you think? Why, why is she why, so important? Why is Klein so important? Well, because, because Freud explored the Greco-Roman lair and Klein filled in the Minoan Mycenaean lair. Klein brought in the mother complex, not just as a target of Oedipal desire, but that pre-Oedipal overwhelming mother, she brought the breast. What can be more important than the breast, man? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, okay. with that bombshell. Uh, yeah, listen, thanks for everything you do. You've certainly made an impact with all your work. Oh, thank you. It's been fun talking to you, Aidan. It's, it's, it's... Look forward to talking to you again before too long. We'll do the superego conscience issue. Anywhere we can find you will be uh, That's linked great. in the show notes. I think before too long, maybe I'll deliver that talk to the Chicago people, and then I'll put that talk up on my YouTube channel on dreaming and fantasy and awakening. So that'll come sometime, end of February, I suspect, yeah. That's all for now, folks. Leave a comment with your thoughts below. And if you enjoyed the video, click the like button and subscribe for more videos inspired by psychology, philosophy, and mythology.